episode one of the Vanguard Cinema Podcast. Basically, what we're trying to do throughout the time of quarantine, and hopefully thereafter, if people like this kind of thing, is we're going to take a uh, film, uh, in this case, uh, Brazil, and we're going to sort of foil it through the lens of like what's happening and what's going on in society and, and kind of the greater uh, socio-political context of the world at large. Yeah, sure. And to start off this podcast, we thought no better film exists than uh, Terry Gilliam's 1985 masterpiece, Brazil, which he intended, intentionally uh, was hoping to release in 1984 under the title uh, 1984 and a half, you know, referencing Orwell's classic dystopian work of fiction, as well as uh, Fellini's Eight and a Half, which really was hugely inspirational to Gillum uh, from a visual perspective and just the, the surrealism that Fellini um, really popularized with that film. Um, as it turns out, the film was released in 85 uh, due to a lot of issues with the studio who wanted to cut down the film in a kind of Blade Runner style, butcher the ending, you know, take away the meat of the, the, meat of the ending, which is, you know, depressing. Um, Gillen wasn't about that and obviously pushed back, which led to a fight erupting. The film came out in 1985 under the title Brazil, which is slightly less on the nose than 1984 and a half, despite being a clever title. Um, and the film, it's kind of this, you know, fantastical, dystopian-esque, but it, what it was really intended to be was a reflection of the time as Gillen saw it, 1984, when it was made. And I mean, that's why it so blatantly references Orwell's work and draws from that uh, spirit of dystopian fiction. But throughout it, it's littered with, you know, Gillum's own personal idiosyncrasies, his own stylistic sensibilities, the very traits that, you know, nowadays people would uh, use to refer to something as Gilliam-esque, the, the, the visual traits, the stylistic and humor, the dark humor that is prevalent in his work was, was really perfected in Brazil. And uh, an interesting way to look at Brazil, you know, from a political socio uh, standpoint is that it's, it's kind of a very anti-government film. Like uh, the film deals with bureaucracy throughout and uh, just the endless bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake that exists in the government of the film, which is clearly reflecting uh, Gillum's own experiences in the UK and probably America as well. And, you know, there's definitely a reading of this film that it's more, that's kind of an Ayn Randian, libertarian, just anti-government at all costs uh, piece. Do you have any other interpretations of the film? Do you think that's accurate? I think that there definitely is a, uh, the film is an obvious kind of exploration into the foibles of bureaucracy, hyper-bureaucratic systems. Um, you look at the character, uh, what's Robert De Niro's character, uh, Tuttle, and he's this en absolute enemy of bureaucracy because he's the guy that's going to come and just kind of vigilantly like fix a problem, right? And that's like the, the big kind of like no-no of the time. But I think it's important to remember uh, the context in which this film was made, right? You mentioned that this was a film that Terry Gillum made as if it was his envision of what was going on in a real 1984 uh, scenario. And I think it's important to kind of put that into context. There was a huge wave of austerity that was coming uh, in uh, the UK at that time, which is where uh, Terry Gillum's from. He's a, it's a British film, he's a British filmmaker. So Margaret Thatcher um, was uh, PM and, and really pushing this new wave of conservatism all across the UK. And this was happening also in the United States under Reagan. And I think that, yes, this film is very critical of bureaucracy and bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake. And we'll get a sense of, you know, the bureaucratic failures that are happening right now in the time of coronavirus. Um, they were happening back at the time of, um, you know, Terry Gilliam in 1985, not much has changed in that front. But I think it is important to consider that uh, he's looking at the uh, government as hyper bureaucratic, you know, um, and he is kind of like playing into the idea that the, you know, what was the Ronald Reagan phrase, like the worst words you can hear is, or the scariest the words are, is, I'm the government and I'm here to help or something like that. And so I definitely think that there is a push in that direction and you could read the film as sort of like Anne Randian, libertarian, anti-government. I just think that's an incorrect reading of it because of all of the other elements in the film. Yeah. I think there's a lot of direct criticisms of consumerism and vanity and the kind of uh, hyper corporate um, society that was being built in the 80s and really exploded in the 90s and early 2000s. And I think that that's hammered home through the, you know, the uh, odd plastic surgery scenes that happen all the time where the guy that plays, uh, the, uh, what's the, the Harry Potter and the, what's his name? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He's the, uh, he's the plastic surgeon and he, you know, stretches the face and he makes his mother look younger. Right. And there's that whole storyline. And there's also from the, from when we're first introduced to Sam Lowry, we see his own hyper independence on automation in the society. So it's like, Oh, there was a problem with my electricity. And so he like slams his, uh, 
you know, alarm clock and everything like, and it's like he's hours behind, he's overslept, he's running and scrambling. His coffee maker doesn't work, but he takes a sip out of it anyway. He tries to take a bite out of toast that's like completely, you know, flopped over. I just think that there's so many like direct about the la- increasing laziness of society. And yeah. yeah, I think I think it's not entirely unfair to say that Brazil is kind of a leftist libertarian work. However, I wouldn't say that it's libertarian in the moralist sense because Gilliam never was a real moralist, and he also was never an idealist. And I think that is the answer here: is that Brazil is not saying that government can't work. It's not saying that government shouldn't work. It's saying that in the moment it was made, government was not working for the people, and, 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 and it's reflecting that in a way. Like I said, because he's no idealist. He's, he's the point of Brazil is not to you know offer up a perfect portrait of how government should you know act and redistribute wealth to society. He wasn't interested in making those kind of uh, political statements. It's far more interested in brutally satire, uh, brutally satirizing and mocking the elitist class, which was kind of pulling the strings, calling these shots, and uh, making the decisions which resulted in such an out-of-control bureaucracy, which ultimately didn't really lead uh, to anyone getting help, anyone getting the resources they need, which is you know, explicitly portrayed in the film as uh, our main character slowly realizes that his very job working for the government is kind of putting him in a moral gray zone where he doesn't necessarily feel comfortable carrying out uh, the acts that the government is sending him on. And of course, as you said, this is massively relevant, probably more so than ever now, as we see our government, and here in America at least, totally fail in a complete and utter disgrace uh, to kind of control this you know, coronavirus pandemic and to get people help in the way they need it. We've almost seen uh, what you could consider state-sponsored violence, letting, allowing people to die, allowing people to you know, wither away in the face of this crisis when clear and obvious health is is there. Our own taxpayer money has been accumulating, and yet, uh, as a country, we find ourselves kind of deserted by the government. And I think it's this spirit that Gillum is is really trying to point out and really trying to mock more than anything, which is just the utter failings of the government. Not not their not that they don't have potential. Yeah, and I think that it's it's mostly a, it's a it's a criticism of the way that of the government is functioning at the time, and obviously that that hasn't ever really been adjusted. We're still living in a hyper bureaucratic yeah. system, and he's very critical of bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake. That I think it is very clear. You know, yes. uh, oh, you need this form, you yes. need this form, and and one of the things that I think and that Matt Taigan makes a really good point about this in uh, his uh, is either his book Riftopia or the I don't know which, probably both of them, but he talks about how that it's not crazy for people who. Uh, to think that the government is out to get them. It's not crazy for people to think that, you know, the government is bad because whenever working people have experiences with the government, it makes their life harder. It's filling out forms. It's being told that they don't have the right thing. They need to go to this department to do this thing. And he's raising these criticisms openly. And he's, uh, and and I think that, I I think they, they really shy. Um, And I think they are even more relevant now in the time of COVID as we are giving, just for example, say that you have come down with COVID, you're using the Affordable Care Act for your insurance company, and you're trying to do all of the things that it would take to not go bankrupt to get your health care. Yeah. You know, it, it seems it would be something that would be almost satirical if you were in another country, say the United Kingdom, like Terry Gillum was, to be going to have to jump through all of these hoops just to get to your basic needs taken care of in the time of a pandemic. But that's actually where we find ourselves now, which is why I think 35 years later, this film still completely shines. Yeah, and uh, I mean, as much as we... Uh, talk about the UK health system too. I know there's been plenty of complaints from uh, residents of the United Kingdom as well in regards to their health system and the increasing uh, chipping away of that service and the fact that it is a lot less robust today than it was uh, then. And the fact that we have seen it continually chipped away at with more and more extreme right-wing governments, of course, now more so than ever with Boris Johnson leading um, the conservatives. And yeah, just a few weeks ago, uh, Donald Trump was postulating, oh, could America buy the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the United yeah. Health yeah. Services? So, um, yeah, it's and, and then uh, yeah. So both of these countries have been, you know, kind of marred by this these bureaucratical systems. And and, and even something I remember uh, Bernie Sanders saying on the campaign trail not too long ago was that we have a real problem in this country with filling out forms. You know, people are sick and tired of filling out forms to try to just get the basic essentials, the necessities that we need to everyone needs to survive. Uh, you know, obviously we can't just be giving out stuff willy nilly, but. I mean, it's degrading to make people, especially poor people that just need basic resources, you know, fill out all these forms and wait all this time, go through all these bureaucratic systems that they really have no time or energy to expend on just to, uh, you know, get by. And I think that that's ultimately that it's that spirit that Brazil is attacking. And as well as, like I said, the, the you know, the elitists, the, the, the idiots in charge, the, the people that find themselves uh, controlling the system, pulling the strings and calling the shots for people that clearly need help far more are usually these kind of privileged 
um, out of touch elitist that quite frankly just looks stupid to normal people. And I think that's one of the one of the real strengths of this film is visualizing that very dynamic. One of the other things that I really wanted to kind of introduce was the so the what what why you uh, or at least in your estimation why Terry Gilliam you decided to kind of make this dystopian film and it's very science fiction but it's also very neo noir right there's the uh, on the like there's the blatant references to uh, Casablanca and like you know and it's very Humphrey Bogart esque when you're like when um, Sam Lowry is outside with uh, Tuttle and there's all the buildings and the shadows. It's very heavily inspired by the noir films. Either way, that, that emerged when people were, one, really dissatisfied with their government um, at that time period, and two, they, want, they were really disillusioned with reality. They were, that it, things were dark, and they wanted that to be reflected in uh, the work. And I think that he kind of stylistically takes the, uh, you know, the shadow heavy, the, you know, the um, classic noir styling to show the severity and the bleakness of you know, the, the bureaucratic system that everybody's living in. Yeah, I, I would agree to that point to an extent, although um, I would push back a little bit in saying that I, I think Blade Runner is a great example of a science fiction kind of dystopian neo-noir. I, I see I see elements of inspiration in Brazil. For oh, sure. it's definitely not a noir film, but I think that, that he takes a lot of yes. direct inspiration. What, from what I was going to say, though, is like, I think what sets Brazil apart from so many works of dystopian science fiction is is that it refuses to, is, is that it refuses to be too bleak. You know, like, you, you watch Brazil and it's, even in its most horrifying moments, it's still it's still kind of funny, you know? It's a very colorful, in-your-face, entertaining film that refuses to go too far into despair, you know? It, it shows, it, it's, un, it's unequivocal in its estimation and its uh, depiction of government tyranny and of the rape of the planet, for example, but it never dwells on those emotions, you know, to the extent that it's at the expense of enjoyment or Gillum's... Uh, you know, natural comedic sensibilities. And I think that's one of the reasons it's endured so much is because it is such a watchable film and it is so funny and it tackles these issues in such an off kilter and offbeat way that we're not used to seeing them address. You know, like I said, Gillum is not a moralist. He, he's putting this stuff in your face, but he's not shoving it down your throat, if that makes sense. He's not, uh, you know, trying to force his, his ideal model of government into our, into our faces. He's just showing us the failings of the system we live in. And I think there's something to be said for that because he is, He's a, I mean, he came from the Monty Python uh, troupe. He's a, he's a filmmaker and a comedian. I don't think, I, I appreciate the fact that he's not, you know, too far up his own ass in that sense. Yeah, and I think that the truly depressing moments are always kind of foiled with this uh, sort of... Absurdism. Deep, right? Absurdism, yeah. yeah. And also the fact that the way that Sam Lowry develops a coping mechanism is the same way that a lot of people right now in, in quarantine or, you know, at least deep social isolation are kind of coping now. He's retreating into himself. Yeah. And he's building this whole fantastical Brazil, you know, fantasy yeah. for himself where the woman that he's, like, made up, uh, like, he's glam hyper-glamorized, so whenever she's in his fantasy, she has long, golden, you know, fairy tale attributes. Yeah. He's a knight in shining armor fighting against the bureaucratic totalitarian system yeah. and tyranny. Um, and I think a lot of people right now in the time of COVID are kind of uh, experiencing the same thing. We're retreating internally. We, everybody in America kind of like envisions their life as their own movie. And naturally, that's kind of like how we're taught through the pop culture mm -hmm. uh, system that we have. Like I am the, I am protagonist, the protagonist, protagonist of my own narrative. For, like, right. And so everybody has, who, that narrative's kind of been put on hold. And so we're kind of like internalizing it. We're going into the depths of like our own uh, mind and, and kind of retreating. And I think that that's, kind of Terry Ellen's response and kind of how he stays sane as he says, you know, if the, you know, even while the world is falling apart around you, you can always escape into your own mind. And that's one of the readings that I've always had from Brazil is that it's a happy ending if you yeah. just stop worrying about the fuss and the, the kerfuffle and the fact that the whole world is imploding, which Terry Gilliam certainly viewed it was. Um, and I think that's consistent with his other works. Uh, but he is not willing to kind of dwell on and be somber about it. He's going to retreat into himself and he's going to find lightness somewhere. And the only way that he can find lightness in this completely dark world is through fantasy. However, in the ending scene when Sam Lowry, you know, he's been like cut up, he's been tortured or whatever. He's still humming the, or singing, you know, Brazil to himself. And he's off in his own world and, you yep. know, he's completely gone. But in that sense, being completely gone is the only good place to be. Yeah, I guess that is an optimistic reading of the film that I... I never really, I never really looked at it that way, but it certainly exists. Um, yeah, that is, that is definitely something interesting about a lot of Terry Gilliam films is they they often do feature very introverted kind of characters in the in the protagonist role. You know, kind of unlikely heroes or not even really heroes, but just unlikely people thrust into you know crazy events. And that's not totally unusual for film. That's a pretty basic structure. But I think especially with Brazil, Gilliam just you know puts it on steroids in that 
uh, this main character is such kind of a, a nobody, you know, he doesn't really have that strong of a personality. He's not, he's not a macho man or anything like that. And, and that's kind of contrasted in those dream sequences where he does play more of the knight in shining armor, you know, trying to save this uh, helpless woman when, when in reality he's the helpless one and she kind of saves him at least in his, at least in, you know, questionably yeah. uh, sequences, which may or may not be reality, but you know, it's an interesting reflection of, of his view of, you know, you just your standard citizen member of society trying to survive and cope and come to terms with the system they find themselves a cog in. Yeah, I think that one of the things that also kind of stands in the way of this being read as like a hard libertarian and Randian work is the like critiques of competition that are in this film. Uh, Sam Lowry is, has absolutely no real self-interest in um, advancement until he realizes that it might be uh, beneficial for him to like woo a woman. Yeah. And I think that this is really unsubtle commentary, right? Like, uh, and, and not in a bad way, that, that came across as a criticism, but I think it's just Terry Gill making a point. Blatant. Yeah, it, it's, it's just him saying, like, you know, there is no need to be, one, he, Sam Lowry was treated as completely crazy if he wasn't, like, obsessed with advancement, like you are in American society. If you're, you know, somebody who's just comfortable or content, you know, you're, you, then you're not buying anything, then you're not pursuing anything, and then you're not a consumer. So that is inherently crazy, right? And this is an idea that he gets into a lot more on, like, what's crazy uh, in 12 Monkeys, yeah. which is sort of like a spiritual sequel to the film. Um, but I think that um, kind of talking about his like his lack of desire, lack of motivation for success, and having that you know only be altered when he realizes that he needs to you know stop this woman that he decides that he wants to marry. It's just like it's a really interesting kind of like critique about like what motivates us to actually participate. Yeah, yeah, and especially in the uh, what is so interesting about his kind of introversion, the fact that he has kind of seemingly gone inward is you know the world around him is not just bureaucratical and uh, controlled by this totalitarian government it's also you know constantly seemingly at war in the state of panic you know there's explosions terrorist attacks a, a clear reference to um Bunuel's, that obscure object of desire is this, the, con the continual explosions and terrorist attacks that are happening throughout the film almost in this uh you know like extremely exaggerated point that Gillum is making about the, the panic that we live in today and and you watch it today and it seems so much more relevant you know because of the, the post 9-11 hysteria about terrorist attacks and the, the string of attacks and shootings that we've seen over the recent years, you know, this film seems down, downright prophetic. Yeah, and it's also really interesting if you look right now, so we're, one of the big conversations is while we're in the middle of a national pandemic, you like ritzy restaurants are trying to figure out how they can open, right? And it's not all restaurants because not all restaurants have the space to sit tables six feet apart, maintain all these fancy rules, but there's a scene in Brazil that I thought was just so relevant and it's when the bomb goes off in uh and when they're having their luncheon and everybody's eating and then the the waiters just quickly grab like a like a like a covered a little <laughs> yeah. wall and they put it up and so now it's like oh no none the of this bad is thing is happening yeah. like you are a rich person who is now back to enjoying your luncheon which is exactly what happened in the time of the crisis of COVID-19 you had uh Richard Burr and you know um, other, all these other senators offload all their stocks, so they're not you know in trouble. And then you have the House of Congress, all these people, and as well as the you know the just regular non-political affluent. Although this film specifically looks as bureaucratic, because uh, all jobs are through the government in Brazil. Um, it just kind of shows that uh, that idea of like, oh, if it's, if I can't see it, it's not happening. Yeah, just basically society putting a quick fix on a huge problem, uh, putting a bandaid on an issue that you know requires a serious a systemic change. And yeah, I do think that's that that's a great a great point you make, and that so many scenes in this film, so many moments, uh, they were definitely of their time, but they've only become more timely. They've only become more relevant as uh, society has become more corporate, more bureaucratic, um, less equal. You know, I mean, obviously we've made advancements as society. Don't get me wrong, but you know, when it comes to basic government, uh, fucking progress and yeah, progress, process, or uh, it seems like we're definitely still too close to the reality Gillum, you know, showed us in Brazil versus more of a utopian uh, reality that we would hopefully be heading in by the year 2020, which still is crazy. It still sounds like a very, I mean, 2001, A Space Odyssey is probably the most famous science fiction film of all time, and that takes place 19 years ago as of today. Yeah, I think it's a little bit indicative of the fact that our struct, our, our, system, our system is very difficult to alter the structure alter structurally, right? So it's not like in the United States, we can just vote and change our uh, government from Congress to like parliament, right? So I think that inherently there are going to be a lot of uh, the same foibles and the same consistent um, kind of pitfalls and drop balls from the yeah. government. 
uh, which is why, uh, which is what allows a film like this to, you know, sustain itself for so long. Yeah. yeah. Um, if we woke up tomorrow and, you know, our government was great, this would function as yeah. like a weird abstract period piece where we were like, damn, it would suck to have lived back then or and, whatever. And speaking of period piece, one of my absolute favorite things about this film from a production standpoint is that it's, it, it not only embraces uh, futurism, but it also embraces, embraces uh, retro aspects to the production design as well. You know, you see these, you see these giant like tubes coming through the ceilings, these, these very retro looking uh, aspects of the production design that they really don't recall the future, they recall the past. And I think that's also very intentional on Gillum's part where he's, he's connecting, sure, we may be progressing when it comes to technology, when it comes to certain things, but in a lot of ways, we're regressing or at least staying, you know, stagnant. Yeah, giving the appearance of progress yeah. while still, you yeah. know. And I think it's a brilliant visual kind of trick to, to make just such a literal retro future. Because that, that's what Brazil is. I think that's the aesthetic could be yeah. most, uh, you know, explain best, best describe it, describe yeah. yeah as a retro future and i think thematically i think that goes a long way too which brings up another uh film that i wanted to talk to sort of the spiritual sequel at least i think that it, it, a compelling case could be made for it even if terry Hillman's like reluctant to accept that uh is 12 monkeys which was based on the film legette yeah uh, a 1962 film yeah a french film that uh was purchased the rights to by universal in the 90s and a commission or a script was commissioned uh the writers kind of turned it into a complete science fiction, thriller, mind-bending time travel story. And it was the script that caught the eye of, you know, a tour director, Terry Gillen, who uh, co-wrote Brazil with a, screen, with a screenwriter. But I, think, I believe this was one of his first projects. Yeah, this was, was solely written by somebody yeah, else. Yeah. yeah. And what I think is interesting about it is that this one has a much more obvious leftist reading to it. Uh, it's very anti-consumerist. Um, you know, um, and it's, it, it can't, kind of came up, uh, was very politically influenced from the time. So it was a French New Wave work, but uh, whereas most of Americans are familiar with the right bank French New Wave, uh, Curse de Cinema, what's it called? Cahiers? Cahiers de Cinema. Cahiers, Cahiers de Cinema, yes. Yeah. Notebook of Cinema in French. Um, and that was where you produced guys like Francois Truffaut, yeah. who directed 400 Blows, uh, Jean Luc Godard, who directed Breathless. Films that got a lot of attention here. Uh, Tar uh, or, uh, Tarantino's production company is called Band Apart or Band of Outsiders or Band Apart because yeah. of, which is based off Band of Outsiders by uh, Godard. Godard, yeah. So uh, just a quick little reference to that if you're not familiar with French New Wave. Um, but either way, this film, I think, uh, this uh, the left bank of French New Wave, which uh, opposing the right bank, was much more derived from the leftist uh, political movement of the nineteen of the late fifties and the early nineteen sixties, and it was also much more avant garde, much more abstract, uh, much more. Um, art house lacking structure, which is why it never quite caught on as much in America. It was very much a filmmaker's experimental medium. Right. Um, and I think that because of that and because of its obvious leftist undertones, even though it was kind of remodernized, revamped, and you know, obviously influenced by the AIDS pandemic, uh, this idea of a disease which is also relevant now, um, I think that it also harbors much more critiques of um, capital and culture uh, around uh, consumerism. Like there's a little boy in one scene who's sitting on Santa's uh, lab and he's like, I want a credit card for Christmas, you know? Or the fact that like when this lady's out walking her dog, she has like tape across its ass so it can't shit. You know, it's just like, like different things like that. And yeah. added to the film on his own accord. Right? Yeah. And yeah, and he definitely brings that, that flavor to so much, so much of his work, but in particular 12 Monkeys, which under a different director's hand uh, certainly would have been interesting, but probably not uh, nearly as memorable and as classic as honestly 12 monkeys has become because it, it just apply it takes such a great uh script and it applies such a great auteur uh, sensibility onto the you know the director's side where Gillum does bring his sensibilities to the work and yeah he does really exacerbate a lot of those those you know anti-consumerist critiques a lot of his his favorite um societal musings which he uses this as a vehicle to attack once again and yeah i think 12 monkeys is a brilliant work that really um in the age of the coronavirus is, 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 is so much more um, relevant than it probably was even just five years ago because of the, the virus aspect and the fact that the film literally deals with the virus that takes out, you know, not just a small percentage of the population, but five million people. So five billion people. Five billion people, yeah. Sorry, yeah. the vast majority of the, the world's population. So, you know, obviously that's luckily not what we're looking at here. But, you know, again, it kind of exaggerates to a huge degree society, I mean, unintentionally in this, in this, in this case, but I guess it was very steeped in the, um, you know, the zeitgeist of the AIDS crisis and, and a lot of the uncertainty revolving around that at the time when people didn't quite understand or uh, understand the scientific, you know, ramifications of that. I also think it also really functions as kind of like 
uh, foray into the frustration of the left at the time. If you're if a, a true leftist like this film, would you know, kind of comes from that essence of you know the more socialist, communist kind of left leanings. Uh, very critical of capital and and also personal advancement, kind of in a way that we talked about. Um, for Brazil, this film also kind of touches on the fact that, like, if you're not directly uh, progressing, if you're not moving through your life and consuming, uh, then you're not, then you're kind of crazy. And there's, uh, and it's actually one of Brad Pitt's, I think, one of his best performances when he plays the mental, uh, the patient in the, in the mental home who later, you know, is the leader of the 12 monkeys. But, or, um, I think that his whole idea is like, oh, if you're not consuming, then they've decided that you're crazy because, you yeah. know, you're not doing all these, all these kind of criticisms, I think, you know. Yeah, he uses the film as a as a great vehicle and the characters in it to get across a lot of those a lot of those points and and in that way and is I mean yes it has the dystopian elements and again like I said with Brazil it's not so much that it's he's trying to envision the future is it is that he's trying to exaggerate the present to an extreme degree to make a point and I think that's something that's done expertly in uh, in in most of his work definitely Brazil definitely Twelve Monkeys and also in his uh, film The Zero Theorem, which came out about 20 years later and kind of completed the spiritual trilogy of dystopian works. Although, I mean, again, I, I, I struggle to use that word because I wouldn't necessarily describe all this stuff as dystopian. Yeah, these three films in particular, though. Um, and then the one more, of the, just to touch back on 12 Monkeys, one of the, the, the things that I was kind of getting into the frustration of the left at the time is you see that this is a response by these like animal rights activists who are going to like blow up the world because or destroy all of the human life on the world because they're frustrated that they're um, you know and there's the debate between the like three people that are initially uh, discovered at their hideout the kids then they're like oh hey man this guy's crazy like you know he, we know that he's acting like in the wrong direction which is like a real debate among the left especially in the uh, late or the early 60s late 50s when the short film was um, written was this idea of should the left take up militant action? What are the limits of the ethics of, you know, militancy for the left? And I think that this film explores a lot of that uh, in like an interesting um, kind of yeah. hyperbolized fashion. Yeah. And it's also interesting that at the end of the day, it wasn't the, the 12 monkeys, you know, that are responsible for the virus, yeah. just some random guy. So it's Which I think also feeds into the whole commentary, like the left is going to get blamed uh, yeah. no matter what. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. That could just me being extra sens sensitive. Yeah, I mean, that. there's always that question of how much we're uh, projecting. projecting onto the film versus how much of that was intended. But, I mean, like I said, there was no anticipating this pandemic, but this film is probably more relevant now than it ever was I mean, due to this pandemic. And the fact that it's it's in the background hanging over, you know, the heads of the character and society and all this, it's it's, it's almost eerie to watch it today because of just how, like, striking that, that you know, that... that plot element is. Yeah, and I feel like this, well, the two films, Brazil particularly, but also 12 Monkeys, were very critically well received when they came out, which was the exact kind of opposite of the reaction that I remember from the Zero Serum when we saw, which came out in 2013, uh, 18 years later. And I feel like it, it might be because society just isn't ready to look into the future like that uh, and see a lot of the, you know, things that we're kind of doing to ourselves, the addiction yeah. to the screen, the losing ourselves in this, like, like you know, not non-reality. Right. Um, well, yeah, I think the Zero Theorem is interesting because it definitely represents uh, Terry Gilliam at his most um, Gilliam-esque. You know, if you're not if you're not a fan of the director's best works, then you know you can definitely skip the Zero Theorem. It's not like this one's going to change anyone's mind. But for those who are into the, the you know the Gilliam-esque the that way of looking at the world, I think it is a very natural um, you know conclusion to this sort of trilogy of dystopian films, and that it really updates the you know the aesthetics and the interface of reality to the 21st century, especially the digital age. And we talked a lot about going inward, um, especially with the main character in Brazil. I think that's honestly the main theme of the Zero Theorem is kind of going inward and, and uh, coming to terms with the fact that, well, yes, the internet, the digital age, it can provide these um, anti-social effects. It can, it can drive us apart and kind of ruin society to a major degree. But I think what's so interesting about Gillum is like with Brazil, he refuses to just make a condemnation. And here, there's the nuance, and then he also recognizes and realizes that, you know, you can go inward and find great pleasure. You can go inward and, you know, find peace. You can go inward and find the comforts that are no longer accessible in this crazy world, which has been so divided, driven apart, and society, in his estimation, even destroyed. Yeah, which is what I think that there's, which is why I think that this film actually uh, will have a resurgence. I think that people will come to find that it was a lot more prescient yeah. uh, when it uh, when it came out than, than people necessarily realized, especially in a post-COVID world, because we haven't really thought about too much 
how our society is going to be radically changed and altered by the fact that we have all voluntarily begun staying inside our homes. For so long. This isn't me making my fucking, you know, Sean Hannity case to get back out of your fucking house, you know, stay inside, stay safe. But I think that there, we are going to have to reckon with the fact that there are going to be long lasting societal complications from the fact that we are changing the way that we interact. We are all interacting through a screen. We're working from a screen. I probably spend 14, 15 hours a day on my laptop or on my phone or watching television. And I don't feel like that's that uncommon. And I think that the, the uh, screen element is not just, um, you know, in the zero theorem, but also in the other works that we talked about. Brazil um, comes to mind also as being like a very screen heavy society. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of characters, that's like, that's a consistent trope in Brazil is, uh, you know, people looking into screens, whether it's in their, in their jobs or in their homes, like there's, there's a, there's a presence of screens. That's uh, very, prevalent throughout that film, and it's definitely something that Gillum anticipated. Now, with the Zero Theorem, he really addresses the internet itself, which is something that Brazil didn't quite anticipate, you know? I mean, it definitely yeah. understood that the future of work will be done on screen. It didn't quite anticipate, I don't think, that literally everything would be in the screen, you know? Yeah, it definitely captured the work element of yeah. the computer, but uh, it, you're right, it, 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 I mean, there was a lot of paperwork. Yeah. Um, the endings, or I don't know if it's the ending sequence where like Tuttle is lo actually literally lost in the paperwork, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, which is obviously a more a less less than subtle commentary about bureaucracy. Um, but yeah, I think that all of those uh, points kind of shine in their own way uh, yeah. throughout each of this whole like spiritual trilogy of you know societal reflection um, from a, you know a dystopic lens. But I also think that from a um, production standpoint and a style standpoint, I think that. The Zero Theorem really shines. I think he kind of oh, yeah. captures the whimsy that's going to be kind of given to us to kind of entice this new wave of like constantly living through a screen and how it, it will kind of be, uh, you know, childlike and, and enticing in that kind of way, even though there is darkness to it. And I think, you know, he references like the pornography right. epidemic that's going on and people are, I mean, there are a lot of people, man, that are like just like hopelessly addicted right. to pornography right now. And I think that's more of a, of a, of a commentary, you know, as we like lose our physical contact and relationships because of the internet. And sure. Um, I think that sure. that's also going to be a, a problem from COVID. Yeah. But I mean, uh, on the other hand, the only time that the main character in the zero theorem, Quinn or Cohen uh, really feels truly seemingly at peace is when he is in that virtual, totally virtual environment. You know, that's the only time in the film you really see him smile or uh, express real human emotions. I feel so it's almost as if Gillum is making the point that like, while this may not be good for society, it, it could end up being okay for us as individuals and that, you know, maybe we should in some ways embrace this coming inwardness. Well, I think um, it kind of comes back to that point of Brazil and, uh, yeah. you know, he can't, he kind of goes inward because you can't go outward yeah. and, you know, he, he finds peace in, in, in his own internalization because uh, the world around him is so fucked. Yeah. And I think that that is just rapidly accelerated in the work of the zero theorem yeah. where the world around everybody is so fucked that it's just easier to lose yourself in well, yeah, the internet because, and not just the internet and not just the fact that the world is going to hell, but ultimately in the point that it's all meaningless because that is what the zero theorem is about. It's yeah. It's a very nihilist. It all amounts to nothing. And well, it is nihilist, but it's optimistically nihilist in the sense that it takes comfort in that reality. Cause I mean, you can stare down that reality of meaninglessness sure, yeah. and, and, you know, come away totally helpless and defeated, or you can look at it and come away uh, optimistic and saying, well, that's an excuse for me to um, live my life. However, I please to the extent I want on my own terms. And I think that's ultimately Gillen's point with the Gillen, film, yeah. yeah, is that, yeah, to be optimistic in the face of nihilism, to be optimistic in the face of meaninglessness, because at the end of the day, we give ourselves our own meaning anyway. Yeah, I think that I think that's a perfectly fair uh, interpretation, and I, and I think that and I think that um, I don't know. I think I think that as time passes, and I know I said this, but I think that as time passes, yeah, people will have the wrong shit. I should fucking sorry about that. Um, we just, I think that as time passes, people will become more open to that. I think that there was back in twenty thirteen uh, specifically. I don't think people were really ready yet to kind of. To, to like the full extent, like we hadn't really like passed because this is seven years ago, and I'm trying to think at that point. When did Black Mirror come out? Uh, in the UK or in the US? I don't just wanted, to, I don't but know. I don't. I don't think that was when the whole cultural shift. Well, I, I'm just because really in my opinion, the reason Zero Theorem didn't do as well is almost because the rest of the media landscape had already caught up to Terry Gilliam. You know, 
shows like Black Mirror were already revealing to us where technology was taking us in the way that he had, but, you know, in more modern ways. So by the time Zero Theorem came out, it wasn't exactly anything as mind-blowing as probably Brazil or 12 Monkeys was. So I, I, it, that's almost my estimation, is, and the fact that it was lower budget and didn't receive the distribution it deserved. I mean, we saw it at the, at the yeah. single screen in Kansas City where it was playing at an independent um, art man. house. Yeah, the Screenland Armor, our first time ever going there. Yeah, dude, crazy. Uh, um, but it was not, you know, a widely distributed film, and, it, and it's clearly made on a lower budget than some of his earlier works. So it's unfortunate that it didn't get uh, seen by as many people as as it as it probably should have been. But hopefully, it does find a home on streaming or um, on an online capacity because I feel like it does definitely have an audience out there that's you know ready to connect with that movie. Yeah, I feel that, and that's then that's what I I mean. I, I feel like it's. Uh, I feel like now more than ever we're ready for that. So I, I don't think that just because it was covered in, or because a lot of the like, oh, the you know fears of technology uh, were from Black Mirror, which first aired in two thousand eleven. Okay. Um, so that was only two years before this film came out. Yeah. Probably he was writing it right when that show was airing in Britain. Yeah. Um, so you know maybe uh, that was why it didn't. It's also another well. script that he didn't write the script for the short film. Yeah, and I, and I think and that maybe has something to do with it. I don't know. I personally really enjoy the movie. I think it's a film that will have a home and a resurgence yeah. and, and an audience if it were ever to come to Netflix. I thought Christoph Waltz gave an amazing performance yes. in it. I think it's one of his like unsung performances. I think it's really strong. I think that without him, the film really wouldn't have an had the anchor that it needed. Um, so there are definitely criticisms of the film, and in my opinion, it's probably the weakest of the okay. three um, by a good margin. Yeah. But I still think that the commentary that's in there is really uh, potent and worth having a discussion about. Agreed. Um, uh, uh, impression for the time. Agreed, and especially uh, it's it's one of his more intimate works too. Like it's it, it almost all takes place in one setting, uh, which is the main character's home. And we speak and uh, speaking of relevancy and uh, exaggerated elements of our society, this film predated the COVID epidemic by you know eight or so years. But now, uh, I mean, the main character is working from home, you know, on his computer, basically the whole film for some bureaucracy trying to you know, figure out an equation that has no answer, essentially. And again, this seems so eerily relevant today. Just this kind of, this mind, not mindless, but, you know, work for work's sake in your home, staring at a computer, being absorbed into the technology that you're interfacing with. It's such a relevant uh, piece. And I think that just from a visual standpoint, um, yeah, it's so much, it's even more relevant today than it was just seven or so years ago when it came out. And I think that's ultimately the defining element of Terry Gillum's best work is that it ages like a fine wine. The older it gets, the better it gets, the more relevant it gets. Uh, and, you know, it's more enjoyable as a result. Yeah, 100%. I think that's a, I think that's a, a great point. And yeah. that's a great place to wrap. Yeah, agreed. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in for our first fucking podcast. It's going to get better. I'm going to stop shaking the fucking camera when I'm sitting here <laughs> and playing with the buttons on my shirt. Uh, but yeah, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thanks guys. That was good.